Good morning, everyone. It is August 30th at approximately 10 a.m. in uh, Pacific Time. And that makes this open hours. I've got Eric Furiolo here with me. Um, and, of course, Dave is here with me, with us. And that's what this uh, open hours is going to be about. We're checking in with Dave. He's released a couple of, well, I guess... One, how many things? I don't even keep track of how many things you release on a daily basis. Your GitHub account is just just repos upon repos upon repos. I don't know how you manage anything in that space anymore. But so uh, Shifter is the thing that that he blogged about. So we'll spend some time on that for sure. And uh, if he has any other surprises for us, other things that are coming up or other interesting things, and we'll talk about those as well. And um, so before we get too into the meaty part, let's talk about news. And uh, Eric, you have the news about the 370PR1 release or something, right? Yep. So we pushed uh, the first preview release three, uh, for 370 um, up on the CDN yesterday. And we updated the staging website, stage.yuilibrary.com, to... Uh, to reflect the docs from from all the changes that went into this, and so this is all part of our new, more rapid release cycle stuff that we've been doing. So we spent a lot of time in that we talked about before in 360 automating our unit and functional testing so that we can have a higher um, confidence in the quality of our releases and therefore be able to do more frequent production ready releases and. And so this is kind of the, the first uh, fruits of our labor there. We were able to push this out. Um, and so we now have uh, two branches that we use for for development. Our master branch, like normal, contains anything that are, are more like small bug fixes um, and and changes that, you know, are won't, won't introduce any regressions or that don't change any APIs, don't break back any backwards compatibility, none of that. So it's like very stable, uh, s small, granular changes will happen there, um, generally bug fixes. And then 3.x is a new branch that we have. Um, and on 3.x, the, uh, the work which is like a larger changes or changes that we want to get in front of you guys for testing and trying them out in your real-world applications and giving us feedback on will happen in 3.x, and that's where we'll cut preview releases from, and that's where this release that we did yesterday, um, we cut that off of, uh, off of this 3.x branch that we now are working on. And there's some information on, on the, our, the YUI project's readme file on GitHub that goes into more detail about what to expect in each of these branches, uh, essentially live docs, master, and 3.x, which you can look at. And we also have a blog post that we're finishing up in um, for this preview release because we have um, some really awesome event performance updates um, where we've improved the event performance, in some cases up to 3% for custom event uh, firing. And, and since that's kind of a low level... Times. Yeah, what did I say? 3%? <laughs> yeah, three times. 3%. <laughs> Huge gains. <laughs> uh, in, in, some, in some cases, 300%. Um, and uh, and there, there's such low-level changes that we wanted to do a PR that this PR is really focused around those, those sets of changes. Um, so this blog post we're writing up details more of this and some of the benchmarking we've been doing and essentially a call for, for feedback and for, for people to be testing this release um, in their applications to, to let us know if they run into any problems with it. Um, and so look, look for more of that to, um, to come out on the blog today. But yeah, so it's exciting stuff. Awesome. And then otherwise, there have been a few things out on the blog. Obviously, there was the shifter release blog blog post as well, but there was also a, oh, I want to call it a GBS update, but it's not GBS anymore, right? It's now referred to as target environments, YUI target environments. I'm not so seeing anything. Explain the change. There. 
Uh, oh, I don't no. know if you're sharing your screen or not. <laughs> Well, your mouse is gonna, there. Right. Yeah, I didn't see your window. Um, okay, so what ended up happening was a Safari crashed, and so... Oh, uh, yeah, Safari and 6 Now you should that. be seeing something. Oh, I picked the wrong yeah, browser, go. didn't I? Um, right, so, yeah, so there's now target environments. Yeah, so what, what we tried to do here, and, and we did this last year, is we decoupled this idea of which browsers we were testing on um, from graded browser support. And, and really why we wanted to do that is like graded browser support, we wanted to talk about more as a philosophy and essentially it's just progressive enhancement. But like a development philosophy that, that we're trying to uh, push and, um, and something that we try to make sure YUI adheres to the, the progressive enhancement philosophies. Um, and so what that meant is we wanted to instead say, instead of saying which browsers we think everybody's application should work on, we wanted to instead have this matrix of which browsers YUI is tested on. And so that, that was the initial decoupling we tried to do a year ago. Um, but we took it a little step further and we plan to go further with this, which is to, um, to change the the way we talk about this and instead call it the YUI's target environments or the runtime environments in which we make sure that YUI works on. Um, and it will work on more. Like people asked us why Opera is not on the list. And that's that's basically because Opera usually just works. And if we do get bug reports for problems in Opera, we'll fix them in, in most cases. Like they're usually pretty trivial for us to fix um, when they do come up. But it has such a low market share that um, devoting resources to it is just not as practical for us. Um, so uh, with some of the changes that we have coming down the pike for, um, for automating testing, like taking it to essentially an, another level with Yeti, when we, get that in, when we get Yeti integrated with our CI environment, we'll be able to have more devices that just our tests are constantly running on every time somebody pushes new changes into the library. And so this is the first step at that. And the other big thing is we wanted to add Node.js to this list. Um, and essentially with the caveat that um, we're recommending that people use the modules in YUI that do not have a DOM dependency in Node.js um, because Node.js doesn't come natively with the, with the DOM API implementations. Um, now there are some, there are some third-party NPM modules to do that, um, but there's a pretty big performance cost in doing so. Um, so we have this new target environments page, which Best details the, yeah, and we have this uh, target environments page now um, on the YUI library website, which lists off um, uh, has two lists of modules, ones that, that do work natively in Node.js because they don't have any DOM dependencies and ones that are dependent on the DOM. Um, and we have a nice little filtering thing going on there, so it'll be easy for, for developers to figure out whether or not their modules w will work in Node.js. Um, Where's so the list at on the site? It's under Documentation tab and then Environments, or Target Environments, yeah. Okay. So that's the same table that's go. in the blog post. And then there's the list, and it has, like, you know, just our nice little autocomplete filtering so you can type and it'll filter this, these big lists down for you. Um, and, and so we, you know, we, th this is the first step in doing this. We plan to go further with this and, um, and have more of this metadata exposed about which environments certain modules work on. Because some of them, like, we have, like, IE-specific uh, modules that are only loaded in IE, and obviously you, if you tried to include those and run them um, in Chrome, like they wouldn't do anything. Um, so we want to expose more of this information, and, and so we have plans for that. But this is kind of the first step. But, yeah, so yeah. so what I'm hearing, though, I guess uh, uh, two things that are, that are interesting about this. The first is that I noticed that we're talking now, instead of the GBS, which was a Yahoo global sort of thing, the YUI yeah. target environments is now focused more on YUI and what we do with, with YUI specifically with the library. So then that raises the question, is this then a, a reasonable baseline for browser testing? 
for your own applications, uh, or is that something that you m might start with this and then choose your own discretion? Or well, we, I mean, we kind of think that people should should really analyze their um, the the types of devices people are using their applications with, and tailor their development towards that, and and what type of you know, uh, business goals they have or whatever and what type of technology, like resources they have. So if they don't have, if they have like 1% using IE6 and there's only three developers in the company or something working on their web stuff, then they probably should ignore it, right? And, but we want to make sure that people understand what browsers YUI is tested on so that they can feel confident that, oh, okay, well, I need to support IE6 because it's 10% of our users um, will YUI work on IE6? And the answer is yes. And 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 that does. And with the way that we have our modular architecture, uh, somebody who comes to your website or web application using Google Chrome does not have to incur the cost of this extra code we have to add to support IE6. That those modules are only loaded in that environment. Like so, a person coming with to your app with IE6 will get this additional code to make sure that it works. Where Google Chrome um, it will will be you know not having to incur that overhead. So. So then the other question was that since this is now talking about well th this is somewhat of a of a carryover from how uh, GBS the life the the regular updates of GBS uh, in its previous incarnation. Now we're we're still in the in the realm of more rapid updates of browsers and Node.js's versioning. I guess the Node.js versioning is slowing down now. Dave, would you say that that's accurate? Oh, he doesn't have his mic on. Slowing down, but it but is. Would you? It's not slowing down. It's it's uh, stabilizing, which makes it much easier for us to to work inside of it. But it used. It seems like it used, it used to be that uh, version, you know, dot four came out, and then dot version six came out, and uh, there was a, a x amount of time between those two, and the time between six and eight was that a greater amount of time, or is that about the same amount of time? Or would we expect uh, dot ten to come out much much later, or are they going to one dot I don't I'm know if they're going to one dot I just know that uh, nine is actively being developed on because that's what I run locally. Yeah. And then as far as iOS five, um, when when iOS uh, six is out in broad distribution and uh, Internet Explorer then gets in broad distribution, I noticed that Chrome and Firefox at least list latest stable, and Safari on desktop is now latest stable. Um, <coughs> And it's interesting that now the with it makes sense for Chrome that the auto updating happens, but I didn't think Firefox is auto updating yet, is it? It's just recommending well, updates. There, still. Yeah, I mean it's essentially auto updating, but um, but I mean they're they're trying to get to where Chrome's at, right? <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, so the other thing too with with iOS uh, six and IE ten. So uh, internally, we are testing YUI on these on these browsers, and what the idea is that when they, since they're still somewhat in flux, like there still be changes made until the final release of the first release of Windows 8 and the first release of iOS 6. Um, mm -hmm. We're holding off on putting them on this list, um, and when when they do land, then we will update this list to include them and make sure to regularly run all of our, you know, functional and unit tests against these browsers and make sure to try to address any issues um, before they land uh, in their, you know, first public release. Okay. Well, that's cool. I'd, I'm hoping that since it sounds like the the management of the target environments, the YUI target environments, is now uh, firmly in the hands of YUI and it's not necessarily affected so much by... Uh, by Yahoo globally, does that mean that we can expect to see target environments, the target environments updated more frequently because GBS had a tendency to lag behind at times or not get updated very frequently? There was a bit of uh, management churn, as I recall, in terms, not management churn, but I mean, um, 
uh, red tape in terms of getting it updated in the process of meeting and discussing what was appropriate to include, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think... Or is that just wishful? Um, no, I, I think it should be, you, we should expect it to be updating as, you know, these, these newer browsers are coming out and not lagging behind uh, with that because we want to make sure that YUI is fully tested on this. Okay. Well, we could probably talk about target environments and GBS for quite a while, but this, we're here to talk with, uh, here to talk with Dave. So let's get busy talking with Dave. The last point that I want to mention before we start talking with Dave is that YUIConf is coming up. We are doing YUIConf again this year, and uh, it'll be about the same time, uh, targeting the first week of November, I believe is what it is, and pretty soon we'll be uh, sending out some communications about how to submit your talk proposals, so get busy thinking about interesting things that you're doing that uh, you've heard of being done, uh, some things that have changed in the last year, or particular implementations that do you think are worth sharing, talking about, creating presentations? Because we definitely want to hear uh, hear from you and your experiences, and and uh, we can help you come up with ideas. But uh, get busy thinking about that, and we will get um, we'll get some communication out in terms of how to submit talk proposals pretty soon. I don't know the specific schedule of that, but it won't be too last minute. But plan ahead, November, YUI Conf, and now. Uh, Dave, I'm going to pass the uh, pass uh, screen sharing control over to you, so we can talk about the stuff that you've been working on. Awesome! You guys got my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay, so uh, before I get into Shifter, I want to jump over and talk about the uh, the YUI Lint package that we put out because it directly involves Shifter and one of the other tools that I'm working on. So the, the Lint package is basically YUI's rules for linting, and it's what our entire team uh, is expected to standardize on, so that when we run Lint from any of our tools, we will use these rules to apply to them by default. <clears throat> and this was the first iteration, and I actually did it in one night because I needed it for Shifter. <clears throat> so We've got a, an update that's going to be coming to it really soon. But the basic idea is, is that we have uh, two primary lists of uh, Lint rules that we abide by. <clears throat> the preferred list is where we want to go. We want to make sure that everything in our system abides by the preferred list. That is why Shifter automatically uses that by default to tell you what's wrong with your code. And basically, the preferred list is just the, conf the configuration for JS Lint. The, the main part of you know, the pre-definition of all the things that we can expect being global, um, setting max errors you know, the, that we're in the browser, that we're running in Node, that type of thing. Uh, the only real rule that we use is the no, no min, because uh, according to YUI coding standards, anything that's private or protected needs to be preceded with an underscore. That way, when we're inspecting objects, you can just tell by looking at them that you really probably shouldn't be mucking with that with, unless you know what you're doing. Uh, we don't truly make anything private in the library because of the fact that we're a library. We want external people to be able to patch and extend it in case they have a problem. Uh, if we made everything truly private or protected, it would be extremely hard for for us to issue patch releases or for uh, people to, to do a one-off to fix an issue that they have right now without having to wait for us to, to actually do a release for it. So given that, <clears throat> that's where we want to go, but we do realize that you know it's a very large library that we haven't had a whole lot of strict guidelines when it comes to this before. We put together the optional list, and you can choose to pick that to, to run, uh, just so you don't get so much clutter <laughs> across your builds until you're ready to actually fix all those issues, because we do know that it takes a while to go through and, and fix a lot of these issues, so we wanted to give you a, a, an easy way to migrate toward the preferred version, uh, so that the, the optional list, you know, it allows you to use double equals instead of triple equals. It doesn't care if you don't have a use strict in it. It lets you use plus plus and minus minus and uh, white spaces. 
so that it ignores white space rules. Uh, eventually, you know, we want to, to get down to only having the one rule on JSLint. And, and then the, the third list for that is actually the special list, and these things are ones that we feel are okay in certain situations, but not everywhere. And when you use these in the code, you should actually use the, the JSLint uh, code comment inside the function that you're actually using it on, and document why you're using it. That way it doesn't apply to the entire file, it only applies to that chunk that you're actually working on. And then and, you know, explain to why, you know, why you're actually using these and why you're choosing to break these rules. That way when somebody else comes along and looks at it, they understand why it's being done that way. Does that make sense? Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. So yeah. The, the, the thing that we ran into <clears throat> is that we do know that there's a difference between the source files and the build files. So what I'm working on is I'm working on a differentiation between these two to say scan the source files with a certain set of rules, but scan the build files with a different set of rules. Because of the fact that when we add the YUI wrapper around it, then the white space rule gets borked. You see what I mean? If you if you do it on source yeah, that's and everything right. So if when you do it on a source file and everything's aligned over to the left, you know, to make JS Lint happy, uh, when you run the build on it and you put the wrapper around it, now JS Lint's going to be upset because of the fact that your source file is indented all the way to the left, but you have a wrapper. So it makes it a little difficult to to figure out, you know, which you know which one is, is best. So what we're going to try to do is actually make the source files abide by the white space, but ignore the white space for the build files. That way your, your source files still all look pretty, they're all aligned to the left, we don't have the, that extra, you know, the extra tab and stuff to get over there. Uh, to, <clears throat> that way everything is aligned and it looks pretty because we also put this in the API docs. So when it gets printed into the API docs, it needs to, you know, not have all the extra fluff around it that we were uh, originally doing you know, because the YUI ad was wrapped around it. Right, right, right. So there's a, are you seeing the comments in chat or no? Yeah, I'm seeing them pop up, but they go away so fast I can't read them. Okay, so Juan asked if you can disable JSLint. Uh, we currently know because we want this to be standardized. And that's the whole point. If you're building a YUI module, you need to abide by our rules. So for local building, then, well, I guess the, then that makes Shifter targeted specifically for uh, YUI modules that are aimed to contribute back to YUI then? And or gallery. Is just, this is a best practice and... This is a best practice for YUI. So this, this is a YUI build tool. It builds YUI modules, whether it's in our core modules, your modules, or a gallery modules. I mean, look at if you've got a, a, a group of 12 developers working on something, if everything's not standard, it's really hard for them to share. So you can't really expect two people to work on the same code base if everybody does everything differently. Yeah, well, you don't need to convince me the value of Lint, that's for sure. Right, and, and, that's, and that's the whole point. That's where we, f we feel that if we abide by these rules internally, then it's going to be easier for us to go on and allow other people to help modify our code if we have these specific rules in place. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So then you said the YUI Lint, this YUI Lint project is being used uh, in two projects that you're working on, right? And Shifter yes. obviously being one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll talk about the other one after I'm done talking yeah. about Shifter. All right. <laughs> uh, so the, the next thing we're actually going to add to this project too is also CSS Lint rules but we, we didn't have enough time to actually get those into the first revision of this. So we're working on getting the list of the CSS Lint uh, configuration op options that we want to abide by and putting them in here as well so that we can pass those off to a CSS Lint inside of the build tool as well. So it'll, it'll be our combination JS Lint and CSS Lint. And that's why it's also called YUI Lint and not YUI JS Lint. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's excellent. So this is one night's worth of Dave work. Well, that that was like a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it actually took me longer to write the docs than it did to actually put the thing together. Huh. 
often the case. So uh, are there any more questions over there? The connect thing just pops up and then goes away. Uh, it looks like the questions are mostly about beautification and the, the chat's taking care of itself at this point. How many Mountain, Mountain Dews were Dews. required? 27. <laughs> oh. <laughs> In a half an hour. Yeah. No, so so the, the entire... Uh, so on to Shifter, uh, about two weeks ago or so, uh, I couldn't sleep. And I woke up at midnight and I had the the idea for Shifter... And it all it all came into place. Uh, actually, Shifter started in the second project that I'm going to talk about, and it actually just got kind of pulled out of there and wrapped up on its own. Um, so I, I started it at about midnight using uh, GearJS, which is the build tool that Mojito Shaker is using. It's similar to Grunt and Buildy and a few of those others, but I went with Gear because it was really small and it was really really good at what it did and it didn't have all the extra cruft that I didn't need. Uh, and within three hours, I had a fully functioning build system. So by 3 a.m., I had a fully functioning build system that built every module in the library except YUI and Loader. And it's fast. <sighs> so Yeah, that's the thing I love about Shifter is how fast it is. But it's getting faster, right? Yes, it, it is getting faster. So uh, to, to jump over to the blog post instead of the documentation. Um, the, the reason Shifter is so fast is that it not only is it you know, not using Ant anymore, um, it, it's all written in Node, and the majority of everything it does is asynchronous, and it's also string-based. So the, the old Ant system, when it went to build things, it would actually pipe something to a file, write it to disk, perform an operation on it, copy it to another directory or whatever, and it was just writing to disk hundreds and hundreds of times for no apparent reason whatsoever, besides of the fact that it had to. So one of the reasons I really loved uh, Gear is that when I start a process with Gear, I give it an array of files, and it goes out and reads all those asynchronously with Node, and then returns all of their strings to me as I walk the, the build chain. So then I can concatenate them together, and it doesn't actually have to pipe them all in to, to one file and give me another file back. It actually just concatenates the, the, the blob together, gives me the list back, and then I can perform another action on it, like passing it off to JSLint, which also accepts a string. So I don't have to write something to disk and then you know, run a command against it. So the entire build process does that all the way down. And uh, a couple of the unique things that I had to do under the hood to, to get even more of that is that uh, the compressor, I actually wrote node modules for compressor and YUI test coverage. And compressor had the ability to pipe a string into standard in and pipe the results back out to standard out. YUI test couldn't do that, so I changed it. So I went into the, the Java code and figured out how to uh, accept standard in and write to standard out. And so I was able to make a, an NPM module under the hood that when you pipe it a string, it fires up the Java jar under the hood using a, a child process in Node, writes to the standard in on that child process with the string, and then reads from the standard out, and then spits it back out to Node land in a callback. So it's completely asynchronous to run either one of them. And it doesn't have to write to disk. Yeah, the, so the writing that, to disk over and over again is such a big difference. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that, that makes a All giant in the memory, difference. Maybe. Yeah, so I did end up having to put a, a little bit of throttling on the compressor because uh, a couple of people had ran it against something with a large amount of language files, and it would spawn up you know, 30 to 40 JVMs under the hood. <laughs> and yeah, it, that just that just didn't work well. <laughs> so I had to end up writing a throttler inside of it that throttles it to five or eight. You can actually set an environment variable to max that up a little more if you, or down if you needed to. But it throttles the calls under the hood to make sure that it's not piping way too much into YY compressor. So the next step the, is that the opportunity. To, there you go. I think you're talking about the next step. 
Yes. So the next step is actually Reed uh, has been working on adding a, an HTTP server to Compressor so that I can just throw a blob of text at this one JVM and have it spit me back the results. So at that point, Shifter could fire up this HTTP server under the hood, and then all of its calls would just bounce off of that HTTP server and then close the server when it was done. Nice. So it, it could be a, I was wondering yeah, so, how you were going to eliminate all the JVMs. That's, that's nice. I yeah. like that. Yeah, and I can't really talk a whole lot about the coverage thing, but we do have a replacement sort of kind of for that coming down the pipe, but um, and it's a lot faster. But in the meantime, we're going to try to do the same thing to YUI test by firing up the, the server and piping it in and out that way so that it will be really, really faster <laughs> with that. Because, yeah, you like know, while, waiting a while whole... The JVM is that while the JVM is fast, it's like slow to to do its life cycle to start one up and to tear it down. But once it's up and running, and we only need one to be running, we can have it do multiple things. So that that will be the. I think we'll see a, a, like another, a, like big big performance improvement when that lands. Yeah, on on my yeah, I'm actually my, curious about how much machine. of the how much of the execution time is is uh, how much of the execution time is is consumed by the JVM startup and teardown because you know I'm building a module in under a second, so I wonder how much of that under a second is actually the JVM overhead. Well, so it, it also depends on it also depends on the number of modules that you're compressing. So you get into a, a module that has you know 15 language packs or something that has 10 submodules. It, it does. You can you can see the speed increase go up um, because of the fact it's firing up you know five to ten JVMs under the hood, and I don't like that. I want it faster. Right. So one of the the other I nice things about it is it. Well, one of the other nice things about it is that uh, it has a watch feature. So you can jump into a directory and type dash dash watch, and it will watch all the important files. And if any of those files have changed, Shifter will automatically build itself. Well, it also takes it one step farther from that. And if you modify the, the JSON files in the meta directory, it'll rebuild loader for you, too. So you don't have to. That way you get updated metadata the second that you change oh. your, your meta. So I, the, I think I missed just how awesome that was. Can you say it again? All right. So if uh, if you're using the watch to watch your module, it will, and you change a, uh, a a file under the hood, it will use Shifter to rebuild itself. But if you change something in the meta directory of Loader's metadata, it'll actually rebuild Loader too. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> so. Where's the where's the watch yeah, so tool you said? It's actually it's shifter dash dash watch, and it, and it's in the the API documentation. Excellent, and that works for existing file uh, existing modules only. Or uh, Anthony noted well, in chat that it it not if it's a new module. Uh, it should, as long as there's a build.json file there. It should work. If it doesn't, that's a bug, and file it, and I'll fix it. And Satyam's asking right. if you can keep an eye on several sources in the same project. Uh, right now, it's module-specific. I haven't done a directory up yet, but I plan on adding that. Because Shifter also has a dash dash walk, W-A-L-K, that when you go up into the source directory and you do Shifter dash dash walk, it walks through the entire module directory and builds everything underneath of it. And you can also pass dash M for a module to limit to those certain modules. So what I want to do is do the same thing for watch, is say, Shifter dash dash watch dash M this module dash M that module dash M the other module and it would watch all of them. But I didn't quite get to that part yet because I needed it to <clears throat> I needed it to actually build all of YUI before I started adding more features to it. Yeah, 
And also there are other really interesting things in uh, in the pipe that you want to get to that you could be doing instead of building those features too. Yeah, yeah. So the the uh, the the main reason for doing this was was not only to get rid of ant, but it's also to help with our Travis pull request system because a lot of people are submitting pull requests and not attaching their build files to it. And unfortunately, that makes our Travis pull request test unusable because it's not actually pulling in their build files to test against. So what, I'm, what I want to be able to do is whenever a pull request comes in, I find out what module needs to be changed and I can run shifter on it very, very quickly to build it before starting its tests. And eventually, we would like to get rid of the build directory completely out of source and let you run everything out of uh, shifter, just have shifter rebuild the entire library. Yeah, that's nice. I like that idea. Just sending, well, you'd just be managing the source in the uh, the repo would just have the source, it wouldn't have the build. And then the right. build would just go out into the dist? Yes. Yeah, but the nice. uh, the biggest problem with that, though, is is switching branches. When you switch branches, you would have to completely rebuild the entire library. So there's an experimental feature in Shifter called dash dash cache. And what it will do is uh, it MD5 sums the files as it's building it for the debug file and stores that MD5 hash. And then the next time it tries to build, if it finds that one in the cache, it says, oh, you're up to date. Skip it. And it just skips over the build completely. So eventually what we'd like to do is have the entire library store all of its hashes in a dot directory and keep that in source and not keep uh, and not keep the, the the entire source directory in there, only the, the hash. And then when you have your local build, it can compare against the hashes and rebuild only what it needs to rebuild. Uh, because chances are when you're jumping from branch to branch, there's a good majority of the, the library that still hasn't changed. Only the certain modules that have been worked on in that other branch have changed. So then you'd only need to rebuild the modules that are different between the two branches. Right. That'll, yeah. That'll obviously make yeah, a so big that, difference. Yeah, so that, that's taken several modules from 5 to 6 seconds down to 0.5 seconds because they don't need to be rebuilt. So do we have any questions over there? No. I can't uh, see them, Let's so. see. We have Evan Evan asks if he could get a shifter init command. And I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, and Juan that will was be clarifying that we do or do not need to send build files. Uh, right now, we still need to send build files because uh, Shifter is not building anything on Travis yet. It's it started to, but it's not building any modules yet. But Shifter is actually being used to build the NPM module on Travis, so it's getting there. I don't quite have enough Mountain Dew to get it all done yet. <laughs> and I think for, for Evan's question, Dave probably has um, a better tool for the job of creating a new project yes. or module. Yes, so that's the one I was going to talk about next now that I've only got 20 minutes left. So that's it for shifters. Now, now I was saying that there was a command line tool that I actually pulled shifter out of, and, and that's the tool I've been working on for the last I don't know, six months or so. It's called Yogi. <clears throat> and uh, Yogi is going to be the de facto way that you work with YUI tools and gallery modules. Um, let me just show you a little demo of it. So, can you guys see that? Yep. Okay, so I'm in the. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna. So I'm gonna go over here to the three inch branch. You can see that there's nothing there but the build JSON file. So Yogi, Yogi's here to help. So if you type Yogi test, it actually fires off command line tests and then turns around and fires off tests in Grover for you. So a lot of people have been watching the repository and you've noticed that I went through and moved a bunch of test files around and standardized them into where they're supposed to be. Uh, this is, that was all for Yogi. 
That way Yogi has a clear, defined way of running tests. So Yogi is actually going to look in the test unit directory for any HTML file, and it will run that with Grover automatically for you and print it out to the screen. So if I say Yogi test, like I said, you, you see it's running YUI test, and it's also running Grover tests. I can also say Yogi test CLI, and it's only going to do the CLI test that it found. You can also say Yogi test coverage, and it's going to give you a nice little coverage report at the end to tell you how much your, your code is actually being covered. Um, Yogi has the ability to lint the files for you, which is why I said that I needed a default way to do linting across multiple command line tools. So I can pass it the same config that I could pass to Shifter, and it tells me everything is cool. Uh, Yogi in itself has a bunch of things that it can do. It can build your module for you. Uh, it can connect your local account to your GitHub account, so you have an OAuth token, so we can do some interesting things here in a minute. Uh, you can log in and log out with it. So Yogi log in and log out allows you to log into the YUI library site, and it will get you a token from there that you can use to access the API and do some nifty things from the command line. And uh, so I'll, I'll show all those in a second, but then we've got Yogi pull request. That's a new one. Um, you're able to go into any YUI3 module on your branch and say Yogi pull request, and it will help you build a pull request right there at the command line and submit it up to us. Now, it, it's, a, it's an even better wraparound for the GitHub pull request because Yogi is actually smart enough to know what module you're in so it goes out to the YUI library API and it finds out who owns that module and it pings them in the pull request to let them know that they have a pull request that they need to look at. Does it deliver them chocolates too? No, but if I can find a way to do it, I'll do it. It steals picnic baskets. Yeah, yeah, so Yogi, Yogi steals <laughs> picnic baskets. So I was now, thinking it could also return in, uh, inane quotes or something. Uh, actually, it, it does. If you just type Yogi Boo, it'll give you a Yogi comment. <laughs> what does Yogi stand for, I was for, actually Dave? thinking of Yogi Berra, but that's also... Um, Yogi stands for the, the YUI or gallery interface because it also works on the gallery. So look, before I get to that point, you can actually do you know Yogi Build, and under the hood it's going to use Shifter, which... Ah, Broke it. That's what I get for using my, my latest stuff. <laughs> Demo gods. I actually was taking out all the ant stuff from it, so that's what broke that. So it's tying a lot of these other um, specific command line tools that you've written uh, that we have together, essentially. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to get to that one in a second as soon as I can do this. Nope, still killed it. All right, so it, under the hood, it would actually run Shifter. Um, but here's where it ties in everything else. If I go into a module and I type Yogi Serve, you'll see here it's actually fired up a web server on port 5000. If I jump over here and take a look at port 5000, I've got the Yogi Server. You guys see that? Yep. So here's the Yogi server. Uh, I'm actually yeah. showing you your examples exactly the way your example and landing page is going to look. So you can run your examples and see everything from here. So this is the full Selic. That way you can use all your stuff right from here. All right. I'm also showing you your API documentation because under the hood it's going to fire up a YUI doc server and allow you to take a look at your API docs in real time. So if you modified either one of these, your examples or your API documentation, you just reload the page and Yogi's going to show it to you. And Now it's finding all of the API docs for the other modules there too, right? No. Yeah, for, for YUI it actually does something. Integrating your stuff with other stuff. Yeah, for, for the YUI project, it does. So it will actually bump itself up a directory and show you everything. Oh, um, 
Yeah, that, w that way you can see how it interacts with everything else. I haven't quite gotten that to work with Gallery yet, but let me, let me finish with this one. Um, it'll actually show you your unit tests, so you can run your unit tests right here from the browser. And the nice thing about it is that this is a, an actual server, so you could take this URL and dump it into Yeti and have Yeti run the test against it. Oh. And it also has a predefined one here that shows you coverage. So the test console actually reports how much test coverage you have for the module that it's running on. So that, that's all kind of cool. Um, if the I go over here to the test servers are new. You didn't used to have that in there. I like no, it. No, no. Um, so if I go over here to my gallery module, I can say Yogi update. Now update is a it's a development command, so you won't actually be able to use it inside of the uh, um, in, inside of what's on there now because I have it restricted at the moment. But basically, what it did was it converted this gallery module into a real life module. So we have an assets directory, a CSS directory, docs, meta, tests. Um, it, it actually, it, it got quite smart. Um, in the docs directory, it actually creates a component.json file for Selic and it uses the information from the, the gallery API. So it goes out and fetches your information from the gallery API and integrates it in here. Uh, and it also, uh, creates your an index file that pulled your information from the API as well. So it has your code snippet, it has your your summary and description from the actual gallery. Um, and then uh, the other thing it does is it creates the meta directory for for loader. So if you look in the meta directory, we actually have a JSON file that loader can parse and build loader metadata out of. So th this turns a gallery module into something that's exactly like a real YUI module, including your tests. It'll create a test unit directory, and it will actually create a default test. So in order to test this, let's type yogi serve inside of here, and go back over here, and you'll see it's now pulling the gallery module in. And from here, I can go look at its landing page and see what it looks like. I can also look at its API documentation and see exactly what it looks like. And I can run its tests. And you'll note there is no test for this, but so automatically Yogi's going to put in a failing test to let you know that you have no tests for this. It's always failing. Because in the next version of the gallery build, I will be running tests on modules if they exist. So once we get the, the module is converted over to this format and the gallery build to build it, it'll actually become part of the YUI website like this. So you can see that this is inside of the YUI li library site. If we go and look at the user guides, there's a section. Now, this is none of this has been skinned. This is all just functionality-wise. So you see that there's a gallery module here. And when it shows up, this is the gallery module. This is everything that was in in the thing that you worked on. So you have full control over your API docs, your examples, and your landing pages. And then we've got this new little blurb over here in the corner that I haven't quite finished yet. It's stats. So we will be collecting coverage numbers and the number of tests that have passed and failed <clears throat> and the number of modules in the system that require this module. So you will be able to see this module has 75% line coverage, 95% functional coverage, <clears throat> and it's passing 700 of its of its 900 tests. And there are you know 14 other modules in the system that actually requ require this module. Not only are we going to publish this for the gallery modules, but we're going to publish this for our internal modules too. So all of our internal modules will have the same build stat information, and it will tell you the last time it was built, what tests ran, how many tests ran, the number of coverage, all of it. That How's that awesome. for a lot of Mountain Dew? <laughs> it's really making gallery modules <laughs> first-class <laughs> citizens. That's awesome. Yeah, so Yogi even yeah. does something better than that, this too. The vision so, of making so you know how I, I, I mentioned that you could submit a pull request with Yogi? Well, you can also submit a CDN request with Yogi, too. So I can say, uh, 
Yogi CDN request. Oh, look at that. My git root is dirty. I can't commit because I don't have anything good in here. Let me clear my modules out. Oh, I had that command around here somewhere. There it is. So my git root is clean. Now I can say Yogi CDN request. And it's going to ask me which one of these commits that it found that I want to use. I'm like, sure, I'm going to use the default one. Oh, looky there. I have a gallery module in the CDN queue. No website, no nothing, straight from here. And it actually tells you that you have one in and the CDN request the, uh, queue, too. And you have the tools now to create the documentation, have that local server. So from the command line, you just set up the server, you create your docs, you create your tests, and you, there aren't any additional tools needed. You just go to the, to the URL that it spits out from the, the Yogi server and as you're writing your docs, as you're writing your tests, you get to see it right there, and then when it's all done, boom, and out it goes, all from the command line. Right. Yeah, so that, that's the goal for Gallery 2.0, is to get all of this in so that module, Gallery modules actually look and act like real core YUI modules. And some of the, the little features that I'm planning on adding to it is that I'm going to actually build the Gallery build system in the open and runnable on Travis. So you will be able to push the module up, and it will fire off a, a personal gallery build for you. So you can see whether your change broke anybody else's, or somebody else's broke yours. And that will all be done in the public on Travis. Uh, one of the other features that Gallery 2.0 is going to do is it's also going to break the hard requirement of forking the YUI3 gallery. You'll be able to have any... GitHub Ooh. repo, as long as it follows, as long as it's configurable and it follows our directory structure, you'll be able to use any one of them for any module. So that is where the init comes in that I haven't built yet, that you'll be able to say Yogi init, and give it a name, it'll go out to the, the, the API and find out whether you can use that name or not, and if you can, it's going to create it for you, mark it as pending, and then create all the stuff in the directory for you, and then you, you have a fresh thing to start with. You have a default index page, a default test, a default JavaScript file, you know, everything that you need. So eventually Yogi test will run here too. I just, I didn't quite get to that port yet. Uh, because the gallery module also relies on YUI, so I have to make the testing system not only pull in the gallery modules, but it has to be able to pull in YUI to run the tests. But it's getting close. I think, the, yeah, the, I think the silence you're hearing is just the jaws dropping. <laughs> <laughs> so is is Yogi smart enough to know, like, because um, it seems like certain commands only make sense if I'm in the gallery or if I'm in the YUI project. Is Yogi smart enough to realize that, that um, when I'm running it inside of a particular project that it can do different things? Yeah, so here, this is inside of my gallery module doing a Yogi help. You'll see the CDN request help. Oh, we actually are just seeing your browser. I think maybe there's something wrong with the connect thing. We're not seeing your terminal window. All right, I need to well, I'm on my terminal. Yeah, we can connect. Got it now? Okay, now we see it. Yep. Okay, so in, from inside go. of my so from inside of my gallery module, typing Yogi help shows me CDN requests. But inside of the YUI library, it shows me the GitHub connection and the pull request. But there's no CDN request. Nice. So it knows the difference, it knows it's it knows when you're inside of nice. YUI versus anything else. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, some of the other things that we're looking at, too, is, is to have Yogi uh, be able to, to put in a strict mode that would then actually write something into your local .git uh, pre-commit hook that requires it to pass tests before you can commit. 
you know, just little things like that to help people make sure that when they're publishing something, they're not actually publishing something that breaks. And on that, you know, uh, as of last week, or the last gallery build I did yesterday, took 57 seconds. So we're going to have really <laughs> nice, fast gallery deployments uh, and, and seamless operations. So that's all I got. I mean, we're it's pushing nice at 1 o'clock, so. It, so is it available yeah, for yeah. people to start using now, Dave? Uh, yeah, Yogi is on NPM right now, so you can do a NPM dash G install Yogi. Uh, but it also comes with that giant warning at the top that says this is experimental. Use this at your own risk, because I can't guarantee that I'm not going to change something under the hood. Um, the the most important part though is that gallery owners should not delete their ant files yet, because this is not part of our gallery build. I still have to write that, and once it does then it will use shifter under the hood, which will automatically convert the ant files into a build JSON file and run. But they can but move over to shifter right now. Right, as long as they do not delete the ant files yet. Because if mm -hmm. they delete their ant files, the gallery build will not work. Uh, thanks again for, for coming in. And uh, so I think let's close this out. So for uh, Eric, and uh, Dave and this is Luke and we'll see you um, uh, next week